My name is Jose Castrolion. I'm uh, the responsible of the cloud, the private cloud solution that we have at CERN. And uh, this is going to be like the last talk that the CERN folks from the cloud team are, are going to look at. Uh, so we are going to talk about the storage in the CERN private cloud. And if you, know, if you want to know what is uh, this part of equipment, is a cryostat that has been installed during the launch shutdown two into the tunnel that is going to be used in the high luminosity uh, LHC version that we are going to have later this year. So we are, what we are going to do is basically uh, interact, interact a bit of what we do at CERN and what we do in the CERN cloud service. And then later on, uh, focus on the cloud, on the storage area, all the design choices that we made the kind of the great things that happen, and also the kind of the pitfalls on the decisions we made, and all the things that we have been experiencing over time, and try to uh, address them in the future. So, the CERN is the European Organization of uh, Nuclear Research. It's the world's largest uh, physics lab, and it has been founded by 12 member states in 1954. Now, we have uh, collaborators all over the world, in uh, 23 member states and many other associate uh, countries. And what we do is fundamental research in physics. We have many, many, many experiments. The kind of the most known is the uh, four experiments that are in the Large Hadron Collider. But then we have many more that were like, uh, seen in the right hand side of the slide. So when you inject hydrogen into the setup, ionized hydrogen, then you pass through the whole history of accelerators in the, in the complex, from the booster to the uh, linear accelerator, booster, the proton synchrotron, the, synchro, uh, the SPS, the synchro proton synchrotron, until you reach kind of close to the sweet of light in the LHC, in which we uh, collide those particles in one of the four main experiments. But we also have more experiments after, uh, underneath. Kind of the most common that you may know is the antiproton decelerator that appear on the uh, Demons and Dragons uh, book. So to give you a bit of, uh, of the size of the complex, we have two sites, uh, the one in uh, Megan and the other one in Prevesan. We are located in the, in the border between France and Switzerland. And the LHC has 27, 27 kilometers of circumference. And uh, this is just to give you a size of the scale of the largest machine the mankind has ever built. And to support the, ex the, collision, the analysis and simulation that the physicists are doing with, the, with this machine, we built the, uh, the cloud service. It was built in July in 2013 by a team of, a team of engineers, and we are focused on providing resources for the, for the whole organization, physics and also non-physics services. What we have is a fleet of hypervisors based on CentOS 7 that we hopefully will have CentOS, 7 stream, CentOS Stream 8 soon. And in a single data center that we have located in Geneva. And we are going to add another data center in the other site in Prevesan soon, but I will uh, mention that later. Is deployed in several regions that are not fully independent in a highly scalable architecture with 48 cells across the site. And maybe you, you get surprised that we are running the stain release, but this is because we are carrying over the same cloud since we started in 2013, upgrading it in place. Although some of the services we have are already moved into the Serena release. To give you also an, uh, an overview on the stats, we have 9,000 servers managed, and uh, if we look at the kind of the changes that we did in the, in the last couple of years, we uh, changed the fleet that was taking care of the batch compute farm from virtual machines to uh, bare metal. So this is why we got a drop on the number of hypervisors that we are handling. The number of users that we have right now is basically the services that are hosted on the organization to do websites, to do applications, to do uh, design of micro uh, to micro microelectronic devices, and so on and so forth. This is more or less kind of the, all the resources we have. And this is the, bus, the, the services that we run in production currently. So we have uh, on the 
upper part, we have all the services that are known by you guys in terms of OpenStack or Open Infra. But then we need to build some code and uh, meet, uh, have some glue to offer to, to be able to offer it in production. I'm talking about aggregating the data that we have uh, collecting in all the hypervisors to monitor it. We have uh, uh, automation tooling. We have probing to test that actually the infrastructure works in, uh, in scale over a longer period and other integrations that we need to make it to adapt it into the park. And what I'm going to talk about is mainly these three components that are Cinder Manila glands that are conform this storage area in the central. And what we're going to do is like basically start from July 2013 and going over the timeline from the last almost 10 years and, in, and see all the kind of the pain points and decisions we made and uh, what are kind of the the takeaways that we can take from those, so then you don't, com uh, you don't uh, take the same mistakes as us, I would say, or you can benefit from uh, all the learning experience that we had. So the thing is, at the very beginning, we started just with plans. It was pretty simple. We just need that. And it was, we were looking at adding additional volumes. At that time, it was called Nova Volume. But then, uh, then it was superseded in a different project called Cinder, and we just jump on and add it in there right away. For support reasons, we introduced two technologies or two technology stacks, mainly KVM and Ceph for Linux VMs, and Hyper-V and NetApp for having, vol um, having VMs and volumes on Windows hypervisors. What it was like extremely difficult then was after quite some after some upgrades that we did on both setups. Having a small team and uh, need to maintain these two different technology stacks and to even upgrade that, and we just, just to have a fun fact, um, not having root access on the NetApp filer and connecting to it, and every time we were upgrading Cinder, realizing that the ACLs for the driver were changed, and then you need to look at it again, and it was like failing every single time. <laughs> If you have root access, that's great. But if you don't have it, that's the problem we had. So that is kind of a pain. It was a, a big pain uh, on our side. So what the first thing that we did, it was like, OK, that was a bad decision at the moment. And then, OK, let's focus on, on consolidate everything on Ceph. We did a first investigation running Windows on KVM, and that was OK. And the main reason of having the so the technology stack with, uh, with Hyper-V was mainly support. To get support from the vendor it was nice because you send the whole package, in this case to Microsoft, and it's like, this doesn't work. Please have a look. But we never used that one. So we decided to launch a campaign to recreate all those machines and into uh, boot from volume machines on KVM. It was accepted by the, by the users at that time. And that was kind of uh, as a last resort measure to try to simplify the setup and make it easier and more scalable. And what we end up also doing is like we retype all the NetApp volumes because we are having uh, quite some pain uh, up m managing it. But then we hit the first, the first issue. Is you know I mean when you have hardware in production, then after some time it gets out of warranty, you need to replace it, and the set team came, came, and we need to change the monitors, and the monitors have IPs. And if you look at how the block device connection is calculated in, C in Cinder when you attach a volume, those IPs are persisted in the Nova cells. So then if you change those IPs and you provide all the monitors, you just hit this by that we reported, I think, like seven years ago, something like that. The funny thing, though, is that the client is able to connect to the new mons. So the, the protocol is able to, if there are more monitors in there, the client will negotiate and change those on the fly. The problem, real, uh, the problem underneath is that if you restart the boxes, it will rely on what you have in the database that is grown. And those machines will never be able to start. So what we ended up was writing a script that allowed us to uh, go through the databases and. Uh, and change those IPs that are persisted on the, on, the, on the database, on all the Nova cells we have, and also on the Cinder DBs. And if you want to have a look, it's in this, in this uh, repo over there. 
the second issue we got, it was mainly a user. It was like a, a triggered by an alarm that was raised on the setup that the backend was offline. And they were like, we were completely surprised by why this backend is busy searing blocks on a volume. So if you, when analyzing that, it was actually a user that had a volume with many allocated blocks was trigger, so trigger the deletion of that vol so trigger the deletion of volume. If you look at the backend, there's only a single thread. It will go through the through the driver, get to the volume, go through all the blocks, and will uh, will zero every single block this, vol this volume has, and preventing any other operation on the volume on, the on that backend. So you have a single user producing a DOS on your nice and highly reliable backend. So that is something that we spot, and we what we did was uh, contribute to the community and offload deletion that we basically is just uh, having a second thread. So the main thread will move the, uh, move those objects into the trash, and then the helper thread will go kind of catching up later and uh, go those go to those volumes and then delete those zeroing those blocks. And what we need to do just to check that the helper thread is never kind of crashing behind we monitor the, the trust line of every single backend we have. And you can see there in the graph, there's like we hit it on the 25th of May, we hit a volume that was like stuck, uh, stuck deleting, but it was, it was able to catch up. So it never fired the alarm. I don't have it in the slides, but we actually, we have the same thing on Manila. And thanks to the Manila contributors, they, they uh, changed the, the driver that we use for CFS. And now this is no longer the case on Manila, so it's working perfectly fine. Sometime, sometime later, we added S3, the S3 uh, service. That was the last one added into the setup. That uh, the Ceph team offer us a Rados Gateway a API to connect to, to our cloud. Just to, just to let you know, this, this S3 gateway was already used in production by the uh, two big experiments, Atlas and, and CMS. It had already users. It's not something like you like uh, when you start a cloud, you deploy a Rados gateway that is exclusive for you. You just deploy one that is already available. So it has already other keys. So the so okay, let's let's give it a try. We configure it and just we start to see that all the operations that were done on that S3 server were delayed. we because all of them were, they were trying to validate the EC2 keys against our Keystone server. That was, uh, that was adding considerable latency on every API call that the, uh, every HTTP call that, that the S3 service was receiving. So we had to turn it off because it was affecting those, uh, the two big experiments. And <laughs> we ended up writing another script that, that I, can, I can point you to that one, that synchronized keys between the, what we have in the cloud to the Rados, Rados Gateway accounts. And it does it at a 15-minute interval. That is easily kind of deployable. It works for us. But then sometime later on, the, the, uh, after reporting to the, to the SEP developers, they realized that this order needs to be changed on, on, this, on, this typical, on these cases. So they, they just change it in a, in a way that can be configurable. So now we are looking at changing it again and see that, that it works properly. The, the thing is, once you have added the, these, uh, this kind of service, there's no Quora support embedded in OpenStack. So we had to build some tooling to offer the same kind of quality of service as any other OpenStack product that you may need to do if you add it in the setup. So let's say we have all the services deployed. So the first thing, the first thing is like uh, comes to your mind, what happens if at, during the night there's like something burns and and you need to keep the APIs up. So from the service perspective, relying on a single backend, it doesn't fly. If you look at the services we have deployed, Glance and the S3 gateway, they are kind of perfectly scalable and inherently HA since the beginning. In Cinder, we just added the HA at all levels with a coordination cluster that's like we are using Zookeeper for that. And all the backends we have configured, we have, uh, they are configuring a cluster mode, so then they are all up, and we, if we lose, like we need to lose a, a kind of 
Uh, we have currently five, so we need to lose another four in order to get start to kind of get some noise in the in the APIs. From the Manila perspective, we have the uh, API and scheduler in active-active mode, but then we still have a kind of an issue with the with the client because it has exclusive access to the ZFS cluster, and it's like that prevents that we have another client connecting to the same ZFS cluster. And it's something that we need to look at, and or maybe it was fixed already, even though that we are re running kind of a recent recent release. Something this is something that we hit hard on us, and this is was kind of something starting that when we started to deploy the Ceph clusters, they were very very reliable, and that's a problem, <laughs> actually. They were that reliable that we ended up kind of creating one type per QoS setting and per backend. Do not have a scheduling. We don't need this. It's, it's like fully scalable, fully reliable. We go for that. The moment you start to add more QoS settings, higher throughput, encryption, you start to, you start to get more and more volume types. And just try to think about it. If you offer a user a quota request with 20 different fields, with volume types, with different QoS, and this is with encryption, this is with not encryption, this has more IOPS, this has less. At the end, that is completely, <laughs> they cannot understand the difference between those. I will, uh, they will just go to get the, give me the standard one, I'll, care, I, I'll take care of that. So then at the end, having this extremely, extremely uh, number of volume types that provide different features, actually they are, no, uh, they are no longer used. So they, you have at the end, you have an unbalanced use on the backends. And at the very same time of having this volume, expl uh, volume type explosion, we got a bug on the encoding issue on the one of the set cluster that actually teared down the whole cluster that were very reliable and, very, uh, and they had a bigger uptime. So what we ended up was like, oh, let's have a look and then let's bring back the assets properly that we didn't have from the start. So we were adding more backends, more set backends on the on the Cinder setup. So it was okay. We can have a look, we can have a look and see if we can do it. Uh, we can do the changes in Cinder so it can support from a non asset setup to an asset setup. But it is nothing. It's not supported anywhere. But if you look at the the Cinder change, uh, the David, the, the schema is like, let's, it's just changing a field in the database. Where is this volume managed to? You stop pretty much everything. You change the field in the database. That should be that should be easy, right? So we did an intervention for for doing that to change that. So we enabled three volume uh, three uh, zones on the main volume types. So the main one is like this is standard one that we see over there. So you, what you expect just after enabling this is like the requests are equally distributed about the clusters, right? This is what we were expecting too. But actually, they were keeping to be added on the, on the older one that were, we were trying to evacuate a bit. The reason for that is that we those clusters, they are not, they don't have the same size. The kind of the bigger one was much bigger than the other two that we kind of build them on the fly to have all the availability zones for storage. And actually, there's a setting that is called the max over subscriptions ratio that was hitting us so badly that was like making only the only one that was like useful, <laughs> the only one that was available was the Beasley cluster. So what we ended up doing was like tweaking those ratios to make it them similar. And then after that, then the, the volume requests were kind of hitting the other two as well. And the idea kind of later on is to remove that feature once those are kind of equally balanced. As a consequence of this introduction of uh, interaction of AC of a sets on the setup, we added another cluster in the critical area. That was a cluster that was like getting old, needs to be removed, and we need to evacuate the clients towards this new cluster to replace it of this existing capacity. 
scheduling changes was just, OK, we just tweak it, so then it's going to choose the new cluster, and then existing customers on the old, older one, on the older, older availability zone on the same type, will just need to retype and change the set. That will be enforced later on. The idea is that the user just by himself can do the uh, retype, um, uh, retype operation, but the only concern is that you cannot have any snapshots because this, those cannot be moved. The idea is to use the migrate, the migrate uh, path on Cinder. Although we have one, one issue, that is what happens with the machines that we were created from boot from volume, because those cannot be detached. And, but for that, we, the, what we are asking them to do is that just ping us, uh, create a ticket on, onto us, so that an admin can intervene and uh, detach those volumes and proceed with the, chain, the, with the transfer. So, if you are, so as takeaways of this of this talk, if you are if you are doing a conversion of an image that this happened at the very beginning when we moved from KVM, so from Hyper-V to KVM, there was an image conversion because the formats that were on on, uh, on Hyper-V and what it was sent up then down to raw on Ceph were not the same, and there is an, there is like a conversion that you need it needs to happen in the Cinder controller. So you need, to pre you need to have space or additional storage on the Cinder controller if you want to do that. If not, you will get a very nice alarm as out of disk on one of the Cinder controllers, it will kind of just pop off. If you are doing a similar operation like migrating volumes that we are doing now, and you are using the default migration path provided in Cinder, just have a look on the block size setting. This setting establishes the amount of memory that you are going to uh, read from the source backend and you're going to write on the destination backend. So depends, depending on the size of that setting, you may get more throughput. If you tune it properly, you get more throughput and then the transfer will be much faster. And something that hit us like a, a long time ago was like some users delete the, those images that were used for some experiment workloads and those images need, need to be back. This is just for uh, to execute it again to validate that the results of the of the new method of uh, of uh, detecting particles they were compatible with the with the results that we had back in the, in the past. So we built some archiving of the deleted images that we keep for longer periods for keeping for allowing those users to come back to us and ask, please uh, restore this image for us. So. Now jumping on the things that we are currently looking at, Manila is, is kind of, uh, the usage of Manila is kind of enormous now. Uh, we have plenty of Kubernetes clients, and those are, are using Manila CSI to deploy, to have shares on our setup, and the usage of Manila is exploding. The problem, it goes, it goes so, it's now so famous over there, that the clusters are having more and more shares. And something that we, are, we have been hitting is like the startup times of the process that handles those shares is taking like 30 minutes just to start. And it's because it's the, it needs to calculate all the shared locations for every single share that is hosted on the path at boot time. So this is something that we need to look at and need to address. But then you only see it when you reach certain size of the setup. The other thing that we are looking at is the performance on RBD for Windows of this boot from volume VMs that we have. The, uh, this is probably, could be our fault, but this is the, also the way that the Windows at boot time and also in during upgrades, they do the I.O. in a different way that uh, Linux, Linux Box does. The, the, we are, what we have been seeing is non-aligned I.O. hitting the RBD, the RDB cluster. So then the, the uh, limits that we have on IOPS they are hit it way early on. So then the performance they are getting is kind of pretty poor. We did apply some workarounds to define the physical and logical block size for those devices on the hosts, so on the VMs. But we still have this problem with performance. And this is something that we may need to think about it and maybe change the QA settings that we deploy. And all those decisions, you just need to think about when we deployed the certain cloud, it was built in a, it was 
constructed in a data center was not meant to be, not designed for hosting IT services like we do now. So some considerations like, for example, availability zones were not considered from the start. And if you look at the kind of the expectations that we have for the upcoming years on the accelerator and mainly on the next run of the LHC, that we need to have more capacity. And just for that, we are building a new data center in Prevesan. That is going to be, when it gets fully deployed, three times the size of the data center we have right now. In data, data center, what we are going to do is like consider a set from the start and have a dedicated control plane for the, open, for the OpenStack Cloud in there, completely independent. We want to use this setup as as the baseline for disaster recovery and business continuity of the, of, the, of the site. Things that we are looking at are changing the layout of the hypervisors. We may go to be in a setup that is without disks or both from volume everywhere. And this is just to simplify the kind of the, the hypervisors and keep the kind of the maintainability costs lower. As we want to offer business continuity and disaster recovery, we are looking into seeing the replication, uh, replication also of CFFS, replication on uh, object storage, multi-site uh, uh, setups for, uh, for S3, to be kind of transparent for the end user where the data is located. In, in, kind of, in conclusion, what we are doing is like rebuilding the building blocks in which our users are kind of constructing their applications and go more or less like what everyone else is doing and getting uh, all the feedback you gave us and implemented in production. And this is going to be exposed in a region as of the other five we have, but this is completely independent. So it means that we need to sync quotas, we need to create projects on both sides, we need to do all this additional overhead to manage it. And I just wanted to thank you for, uh, for attending this uh, talk. If you want to know more information about us, you can uh, just go to those, one of those links in the tech blog. We have more information about the cloud and what we are doing. All the code that we have is open source. You can get whatever you get from there. We have the local patches, we have scripts, we have a lot of stuff in there. And I would just want to thank you, thank all my team colleagues without their kind of uh, hard work. I wouldn't be here and presenting this to you. Thank you. I think I have two minutes for questions. Sorry for that. <laughs> so please use the mics if you want. Thanks for sharing such a great uh, uh, experience. Uh, just out of curiosity, uh, what uh, release of Ceph are you running right now? Sorry? Because what release of Ceph are you running right now? So we are in Octopus in all the clusters. OK, thank you. We don't have Pacific. We are testing Pacific, but we don't have, a, we don't have it yet. <laughs> Hello. Hello. You are using uh, the same cloud since the beginning. Yeah. And what kind of storage backend are you using for Nova and Glance? So for Glance, we are using uh, we are using Ceph in a different pool, and for Nova, what we are using is a so we are using the firmware storage available in the hypervisors. So the disk, local disk on the hypervisors. We are not using the Ceph cluster, the Ceph cluster as for a firmware. So at the beginning, you were already using um, Ceph for Glance. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That was kind of the f our first usage of Ceph on the cloud, yeah. OK, thank you. Welcome. Is someone over there? Yeah. Hi, uh, you mentioned about um, using some uh, services with uh, like Xena um, really. Yeah. Uh, maybe I missed something. Uh, can you repeat or exp yeah. so, so explain the thing uh, what's, what, what, kind, what services are you using okay. which are compatible, which has, has yeah. have compatibility with older yeah. versions? Let me 
Uh, okay. Yeah, that's the easiest one. Okay. So the thing is, um, so if you if you if if you think about it, the the thing is, all the services, well, they, except like a couple of them, they don't have bindings between each other. So actually, something is something that we discovered very early on. So actually, the only ones that we use that are kind of bind together is Neutron and Nova. The other ones we can go further up in the in the in the, in the setup. So actually, uh, sorry, Cinder and Nova, Neutron and Nova, Neutron and Nova, they are both in Stein release right now. And this is like what is the last last hurdle we we have to move out of CentOS 7 and start doing a CentOS Stream 8. So once we have those services move into train, that is the kind of the compatible release between these two OSs, then we can just jump into, into train, uh, so just jump into train, start having hypervisors, moving things around, and start catching up. The remaining services, they are way higher up. We have the all set up except Glance, so all of them, they are in Wallaby, and Glance has been just upgraded to Srena. Because they they talk about they talk with the APIs to download so Nova talks with the Glance APIs to download an image. It doesn't need if, it, if the API is compatible, it just works. Right. So right. just the That's only sure. these two that are Neutron and Nova that are doing RPC calls underneath mm -hmm. that these they need to be tied. Thanks. Right. Uh, and what about case Keystone? Keystone is in Wallaby now. Oh. Uh. Yes. Everything is in Wallaby oh. except these two. Uh. The second thing uh, you mentioned about uh, Windows performance uh, that on, on is RBD, uh, yes. uh, crappy. So, uh, have you ha have you tried to maybe delete uh, delete uh, or set to zero a page file on Windows? Uh, and we did maybe we it will. Uh, we did not get do any more performance. We did not do any tuning on the on the VM itself. We just kind of doing with the standard configuration that we do. We, we have all, all, all the Windows images on all the Windows desktops. Exactly the same configuration settings. We, we didn't go that far. The just the the pattern is just different. I mean, the what I can tell you is like if you look at the pattern of IOPS during boot time is extremely different at what it happens later on. What we saw later on is actually the physical block size and the logical block size that we set up that is 4K. 4K, no, it's emulated 512, what we have. And then the thing is that you see the, the requests and they are properly aligned. But then at boot time, we don't know what it happens, but actually we are getting a much smaller uh, IO reach and then in kind of in random behavior. So we are trying to understand what triggers that. And also, we, it may, we may end up like just increasing for a short period of time the burst limit on the IOPS operations mm -hmm. that will alleviate the kind of the behavior they are suffering. So we may we, we have some still some tunables, but I'm not sure if like by by cleaning the page file we'll we can fix it. Yeah, ju just yeah, that's fine. Just uh, my. Some kind of uh, you know <laughs> I don't know I, I don't test it yeah. I, I didn't test it but uh, maybe also but it's, it's a pretty specific case I mean it's like just we just see it on boot time and during upgrades that is kind of different what it was like normal yeah. thanks, uh, thanks. We, we, need, we need to have a look yeah Hello, thank you for the talk. Uh, why are you using Xenam version for Glance? Is there any specific feature that you were looking for? No, no, no. It's just that the idea is like we need to kind of continue. I mean, the thing is, when we started, the our let's say goal was be like not so far from the apps from the upstream or a stable latest stable release. And the thing is, we were a being able to kind of catch up and keep the kind of the release cycle kind of close by. We're far behind on Nova and Neutron, and this is just because we are assemblatively using Nova Network, and we are still having customers using having machines on Nova Network. And in the train release, this has been kind of removed from the code base. So the thing is, like, we are kind of a bit stuck behind recreating boxes, 
doing the kind of campaigns of pregrading machines in the new one in the neutron cells so then we can just jump to the next release and what we are going to do is like just once we are there we are moving up faster and keep them more or less close together one thing i can think of is for example cinder i cannot upgrade it for more than uh, wallaby the reason is that they deprecated one of the api versions from wallaby to shina the, the now deprecated version v2 and Nova is still using V2 for attaching volumes in the version we are running. So actually, it's like I cannot do the upgrade until Nova has kind of started using the V3 API. So th there's some kind of more consideration you need to do if you kind of are in this model. It's kind of much, much, much simpler if you have the whole cloud on the same, on the, at the same level. But we need to kind of play a bit on, on feature-wise. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah. Maybe one last question. Yeah. How, much, how many people are you to maintain all of this? Sorry? How many people are you in, the, in your team to maintain the, the entire infrastructure of Ceph that you have? So, so how, how, how many people are? Many ah, how many people? OK, so, so the thing is, the cloud team is actually, uh, <laughs> so we are kind of now reviews. Like we are eight in the cloud team, eight, okay. 10 people. But then the Ceph, the Ceph clusters are managed by another team. There's like another team of four, five people that just take it on Ceph. The thing is, like the set clusters that we are using, they are also used by other by other uh, teams in IT that have access okay. to those clusters. So there's like it's not all together. Let's say like in other organizations, it's like kind of a split, and then it's just like kind of building blocks uh, for other services. And they all do maintenance and upgrade. Uh, you mean or in the set team? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And we have different qualities, uh, different setups, some with spinning drives, some with flash, some mixed. This is like kind of a variety of things. And behind our setup is like, I think it's like eight different set clusters that we have right now with different setups and so on. Okay, thank you.